There is an old adage, I don't know who came up with this, uh, that the first time you learn thermodynamics, you don't understand it. And the second time you learn thermodynamics, you think you understand it. And the third time you learn thermodynamics, you're comfortable with not understanding it. <laughs> and I think that's the category where most professional scientists find themselves because it is quite a complex topic, but we can understand uh, what we, uh, we can understand the basics using a few uh, simple um, ideas. What is, uh, what is the, the quantity that must be minimized at equilibrium in any chemical process? Gibbs free energy, uh, G. So G is the, what is, what is G? What is the, the Gibbs free energy? The Gibbs free energy is the thermodynamic potential that must be minimized <laughs> at constant temperature and pressure in a chemical system. Okay, that tells us precisely nothing about what it actually is. Uh, you may have in first semester physics or uh, chemistry derived the expression for G. And what you ultimately end up with is G, which just as a reminder is at constant temperature and pressure, equals something called H minus something called TS. H is the enthalpy, T is the temperature, and S is the entropy. Where does, where does H come from? Where do the H's come from? Where does, where does H come from? H is heat, so it's the heat of reaction or the heat that results from a particular chemical process, but where does it really come from? Bonds between atoms? Bonds between atoms, how about, um, how about intermolecular forces as well? So if you have two molecules that are far away from each other in space and they're not charged and you bring them closer to each other the, and they're not, they're not charged or they have opposite charges, the potential energy over here compared to over here, is the potential energy higher in one or two? Potential energy is higher in one. So we minimize the potential energy by bringing two uncharged molecules together by van der Waals forces. And by conservation of energy, something has to, has to be ejected and that is heat. Incidentally, uh, do, uncharged molecules uh, attract or, all uncharged molecules attract in a, in a vacuum, is that a true statement? So, uh, Oil and oil, they, do they attract in a vacuum? They're the only molecules in the universe. Do they attract? They do. How about water and water? Do they attract? Yeah, they do. How about oil and water? Do they attract? If it's only one molecule of water and one molecule of oil, they do attract. They do attract in a vacuum because they both have uh, protons and electrons, and one has a permanent dipole moment, which can induce a dipole moment in the other. They also have electron clouds that transiently deflect each other and create van der Waals bonds, which is called the dispersion or London interaction. So the answer is that all uncharged molecules attract pairwise in a vacuum, but a chemical system is not always pairwise, or basically never pairwise, because you have lots of different molecules um, interacting in some environment. So uh, incidentally, like charged molecules, or molecules that are constrained so that the negative end, so that the same side of a dipole 
has to come closer if they're not allowed to rotate, that does, that, uh, that's, that's unfavorable enthalpically. So that gives you a positive H. But for uncharged or freely rotating dipoles, delta H is always, is always negative. You get, give off heat because the potential energy is being lowered in that interaction. So we know, uh, so, so if G uh, at constant temperature and pressure equals H minus uh, TS for a, uh, <laughs> yeah, H minus um, tough for um, any given process, then delta G for a process, the change in Gibbs free energy is delta H minus T uh, delta S. Now, what we're going to be predicting in the next couple of classes is whether or not certain pairs of molecules, so solvents, when they come together as mixing favorable or unfavorable, or polymers when they come together as mixing favorable or unfavorable. And what we, uh, what we get has a bearing on the phase behavior of a solid polymer material, which controls all of its thermal and mechanical properties that we're trying to engineer in a solid uh, material. So everything comes down to, uh, to minimizing uh, the, the Gibbs free energy through these parameters, delta H and delta S. So H is fundamentally derived from, uh, from, uh, from bonds. And I mean bonds in a very general sense. You have a chemist's bond, which is a covalent bond, which involves formal sharing of electrons between atoms in a molecule. And we also have the physicist's bond, which is like a van der Waals bond, which is just an electrostatic interaction that, is, that comprises components from dipole-dipole interactions, dipole-induced dipole interactions, and dispersion interactions. So this is uh, chemical bonds. Or covalent bonds and also van der Waals bonds and also we'll say uh, ionic bonds. These two are really electrostatic in nature. This one is a little bit more quantum mechanical in nature because you have these atomic orbitals that hybridize to form molecular orbitals. But in terms of their effect on delta H, they're similar. Delta S. Delta S can mean a lot of different uh, it, it can, it, it, Delta S comprises a wide range of of uh, entropic terms, but the one we're mostly, we mostly care about, the only one that we care about in, in at least our discussion of this topic in the abstract is configurational entropy. And that is, we picture the molecules as spheres, as occupying points on a lattice. They could be circles or spheres in, in two-dimensional to three-dimensional spaces, but they have no, they, they have total rotational symmetry. They're not they're not rods, because if you had rods, you, had ro you have rotational degrees of freedom as well. We're only talking about configurational entropy. So where are the, the, these circles or spheres on a lattice? And are there more states available before a chemical process or after a chemical process? Yeah? Is that just a simplification so we can express the model in three characters rather than uh, if, 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 you, if you want to, uh, in, a, in a real system, you have to break delta S apart into the configurational term and the rotational term and other terms that might, that might arise. So this is the uh, change in the number of statistical microstates available. <laughs> uh, 
And for our discussion this week and for the rest of the class, except under specific circumstances, so the mathematical treatment will all be for configurational entropy only. We're not going to worry about, about rotation and uh, uh, rotational um, entropy uh, for now. Or mathematically, we're not going to worry about it at all. But I may give you uh, examples of cases where rotational entropy plays, uh, plays a significant role. Number of st statistical microstates uh, available, and this is um, configuration only. In uh, in our discussion, okay. So let's modify this uh, equation a little bit with a superscript m, which means uh, mixing. Because ultimately, if we want to learn something about the phase behavior of and the dissolution of polymers in a solution to do solution processing or polymers in polymers to do uh, melt casting or to predict the, the phases that we ultimately get. What we care about is mixing. So the unmixed state before and the mixed state is after. Yeah. Yes, they can be measured. They can be measured calor, uh, calorimetrically. Uh, delta H is, is the easiest because it, because it just, um, just comes off as, as heat. Um, and you can measure the other quantities by various curve fitting that we're not going to talk about in the class. But they are measurable. OK. So uh, delta, S of, delta S for a mixing process. Configuration only. So you have two separate species over here. And then in the mixed state, they're jumbled up. Is delta S positive or negative? Delta S is going to be positive for the configurational change in entropy upon mixing. Every time. Um, yes. Uh, the, there are, so why do unlike solvents sometimes not mix? So if delta, we know that for a spontaneous process, so something that, that lowers the, the delta G, we have, if we have a positive delta S term, then this term is all negative and contributes toward making this process happen because it gives us a, a negative delta G. So why would, say, uh, say cyclohexane and acetonitrile don't mix? Sorry? So we're taking the mixed state. We're just saying that there is a mixed state, even though they don't mix. The mixed state has all the molecules jumbled together. We can all agree that there are way more distinguishable microstates available when they're all mixed together versus when they're all, when they're separate in like oil and water. The reason they don't mix is because Delta H of mixing must be unfavorable. But I just told you that uncharged molecules attract in a vacuum and have a negative delta H. So how is the enthalpy of mixing unfavorable? Yeah. Do they each have a sort of a homophilic attraction to their own types? Yeah, that's halfway there. So you've all heard the phrase, like dissolves like. That's, that gets you part of the way there, but it's still kind of wrong. The reason it's still kind of wrong 
is because a, a molecule with a relatively low van der Waals coefficient. So because we have all these dipole terms in the, the acetonitrile, it has a very high van der Waals coefficient. It likes interacting with other things. And because you have two things, if you have two molecules of this that both have a high van der Waals coefficient, then that's a very favorable interaction. This and this also have a favorable interaction, but it's, but it's less favorable than this and this. So while it's really because the acetonitrile is excluding the cyclohexane that they separate, because it's more favorable for these, these molecules to continue interacting with itself rather than mixing. Cyclohexane, if cyclohexane had a brain, and it had like crushes on things, it would say, I really wish acetonitrile would like me because it has a really high van der Waals coefficient and I would really like to interact with it. But acetonitrile says, no, <laughs> I like my own friends. So, so the result is not that like dissolves like, but that more, the, the one with the greater intermolecular forces excludes the one with the with the less favorable intermolecular forces. That's quite a simplified picture because there are some examples uh, like the hydrophobic effect, for example, which has a, that's oil and water, what we always think about with immiscible solvents. Uh, but in fact, the delta H is slightly favorable upon mixing, but it's actually entropically quite unfavorable to mix because of rotational terms that again we're not going to talk about because if you we're not going to talk about mathematically i'll tell you why the hydrophobic effect happens uh, because you get solvent cages of uh, of hydrogen bonds that are tangential to dissolved hydrophobic species in water and that restricts the rotational freedom of water molecules that have to solubilize the uh, the organic um, species and therefore even though the delta H is uh, is even a hair favorable the entropy is very unfavorable so this is this is really our analysis depends on the fact that we're considering only configurational uh, entropy okay um, so like solvents tend to uh, to to like um, each other, like chemical species tend to dissolve in, uh, in each other. So let's take, let's take, this is called toluene. And this is styrene. vinyl benzene. Do we, would we predict, based on the argument that similar molecules tend to be soluble in each other, that these would be soluble in each other? They would form a miscible mixture? Yeah. Yeah, they definitely would. But polystyrene, where you have a long zigzag with a bunch of benzene rings that hang off of it, uh, if you have really high molecular weight uh, polystyrene, does it become less soluble or more soluble in the, uh, in the toluene? Less. less soluble. And that, that's a, a little bit in, intuitive from our everyday experience because we have, you know, we have high molecular weight polyethylene that won't dissolve in solvents because we have solvent bottles that we have in high molecular weight polyethylene. And, uh, but, the, but the reason is, is a little bit I don't know, counterintuitive. It's not, it's not that easy to, to understand just by, just by you know, thinking um, because the toluene and the styrene, so the monomer is soluble, but if, if you have a certain number of repeat units, it becomes more and more insoluble the more repeat units you add. And even though the enthalpy of mixing isn't gonna change too, too much because you still have this interacting with this, which is pretty similar, the entropy term, the change in entropy, becomes much and much, much, 
much, muchly less. <laughs> Because what you're doing is by making a polymer, you're confining the monomers, you're telling them that they have to be next to each other. They can't be anywhere, they have to be next to each other. So the entropy of mixing is much less favorable. So if you have infinite molecular weight, the entropy of mixing goes to, goes to zero, and even the slightly uh, the slightly unfavorable enthalpy of mixing takes over and makes them insoluble in each other. Yep. Do you see an increased effect with that in um, isotactic and syndiotactic polymers because there's even less little configurations? Um, so the question is, do you see more mixing in isotactic and syndiotactic uh, like polypropylene or polystyrene because they're so chemically similar? Um, you would certainly predict more mixing in that case um, based, on, based on these uh, arguments. But, the, uh, but if you take into account crystallization and the fact that one wants to crystallize and the other doesn't, um, then you would predict a different kind of phase segregation that resulted from crystallization. But that's a good, that's a good question. Okay. Okay, let's think about uh, polymers in solution. And these are just a couple of sort of high level points that uh, I'm going to write down and by the end of the by the end of uh, next week we'll kind of understand why uh, why this is in a good solvent, and this is favorable uh, intermolecular forces. Can I abbreviate that? IMFs, favorable intermolecular forces. A polymer coil expands. in order to increase interactions with the solvent. Relative to in a poor solvent, it contracts. If you see a homogeneous solution, and this is of a polymer or molecules taken together, what you can say about it, if you see some Sprite, uh, you know that, that it's, uh, it's delta G of mixing is less than zero. And we got delta G by considering, so delta G M equals G of, uh, of 1 and 2 minus G of 1 plus G of 2. So this is the, anytime remember when we're calculating the deltas of any thermodynamic potentials, we're always talking about the after state minus the before state. So this is mixed And th this is, these are the two components unmixed. Okay, I want to derive the expression for a mixture of uh, an ideal, of, of an ideal mixture. And what we're going to do, so this is uh, the ideal, ideal mixtures Ideal mixtures of small molecules, let's say two solvents that are either, uh, that, are, that are miscible with each other, that you can dissolve in each other to get a homogeneous uh, solutions, uh, solution. And the goal is to find H 
and S contributions to delta G uh, of mixing. So for an ideal solution, you have two assumptions. which help with the math, but are pretty unrealistic for most uh, actual molecules, but perhaps pretty similar for things like toluene and styrene. So the assumptions are one, that molecules one and two are the same size. And you can say that one is the solvent and two is the solute, but doesn't really matter at this point. And po assumption number two is that we have equal intermolecular forces between, uh, between like and unlike molecules. equal intermolecular forces between like and unlike okay this is these are the assumptions this is what defines an ideal solution this has a has a name in thermodynamics called an ideal solution these are the two assumptions number two is quite powerful uh, in that it does something to the delta H term what is delta H if the molecules have equal intermolecular forces between themselves and between each other? Zero. Right. So because of two, a consequence of, of two is that delta H M equals zero. So the task then is what is delta S of mixing? Everyone see why delta H is zero? So if the molecules are the same size and they have the same intermolecular forces, then there's no change in heat upon mixing. There's no taking in or releasing of heat upon mixing because it doesn't care. The molecule doesn't care if it swaps one neighbor, a neighbor of itself for a neighbor of the others. Humanity could learn a lot from ideal solutions. <laughs> the entropy is, uh, uh, was, was expressed in a famous, uh, a famous way by uh, Ludwig, Ludwig von Kupa, I mean Boltzmann. The entropy is related to the number of distinguishable distinguishable is key uh, configurations by the Boltzmann law which says that S equals Boltzmann constant K 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin times the natural log oh, I haven't done cursive I don't I don't write in cursive normally there <laughs> times the natural log of Omega which is the number of statistical microstates available What we're going to do to, uh, to calculate omega is um, imagine a hypothetical lattice made up of the number of, the number of pieces of one plus the number of pieces of two. So when you combine them together, you get a number of, of positions in a hypothetical lattice of one plus two, number of ones plus numbers of twos. So 
imagine a hypothetical lattice of components 1 and 2. with size n1 plus n2 equals n0 which is, uh, so we have n naught cells of equal size or sites of equal size. By assumption one for the ideal solution. So the total possible ways of arranging a system is going to be n not factorial. Is n1 plus Total number of ways of arranging the system is n1 plus n2 factorial or n not factorial or no. <laughs> but we know since they're of equal size and we only care about distinguishable microstates that if we exchange two like components, we still have the same distinguishable microstate because the switching two like components gives you an indistinguishable microstate, which doesn't contribute to a change in uh, the total number of microstates uh, available. So, uh, so the total possible number of ways of arranging the system is, is this. Uh, so, so uh, but, and the but comes after this comment, but uh, exchanging one and two uh, give indistinguishable, um, I'm sorry, one with one or two with two give indistinguishable microstates. So the net omega equals the total number of, uh, of sites factorial times some term in the denominator, n1 factorial times n2 factorial. And we can generalize this expression by writing n naught factorial over big pi, which means a, uh, which means multiplication of elements with index i of the n sub i factorial. And this term is the total number of states, uh, of total number of, of indistinguishable states available, but we divide it by this term to give us the, uh, so this accounts for, uh, for, dis for um, uh, indistinguishability. And this might, not, uh, this might not make sense as to why the denominator is there. So let me just illustrate with an example. Suppose you have a lattice of four sites with two molecules of molecule one and two molecules of molecule two. 
And we can represent them by open and closed circles. Okay, these, uh, these are the total number of uh, distinguishable microstates. But if, and, and the reason these are distinguish, or the reason that, uh, the reason that these are distinguishable, even though there are multiple ways of arranging these sites, if say we gave each one of these a name, like this one is the same as this one, but suppose we called this one Meg, and we called this one Charlie, and we switched them, and we did the same over here and we switched them. We'd have four different permutations of the way to arrange this, but all four permutations would be the same distinguishable state. So we have four times this, 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 and four times this. But the six are really the only, uh, the only one the only ones that matter. So we have 24 uh, total, but only six distinguishable. And we can handle this because it's enough to see and write down in, in two minutes. Uh, but, but if we had many, many components, then we would use our equation and we would end up with two plus two factorial over two factorial times two factorial. And this is times three times two or 24 over four equals six distinguishable states. Okay. Yep. Um, would you recommend we go and explore how the pi operator that you use there works, or are we going to be okay just calculating with n1 factorial versus n2 factorial? So I'm sure there's a reason we use that notation, but I've never seen that before. Uh, you might have three components, but it's just a way of saying if you had i components, you would just multiply them all together. And that would take out this, 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 this factor of four in the case where you have four lattice sites and two of each. So it's just a summation but with multiplication. It's a summation but with multiplication. Yep. How did you distinguish distinguishable again? Like what are they? So a distinguishable state is this state. Because it doesn't matter if you switch this filled circle with this filled circle. To us it's the same thing. There's no index or no name on these particles. So this state is distinguishable. These are the six distinguishable, but each, each distinguishable in this case has four different indistinguishable states that we don't care about. So we're trying to divide out the number of indistinguishable states from the total set of, of, of total states to give us the total number of distinguishable states. A lot of words that sound exactly the same, mostly involving the word distinguishable and indistinguishable. Okay, so the total configurational entropy um, upon, uh, upon the mixed system and we'll call this S sub C is S sub c in the mixed state is k times natural log of omega and omega is n naught factorial over n1 factorial n2 factorial and by rules of logs we have k times 
natural log of n not factorial minus natural log of n1 factorial minus natural log of n2 factorial. Now, natural logs of factorials can be, uh, can be simplified by use of something called Stirling's approximation. from one of those math courses that was probably a prereq. <laughs> so for large n, we use a sterling. Approximation, which says that natural log of n factorial equals n natural log n minus n, and that gets rid of the, uh, the factorials. So I'm just going to write the first step in the Stirling's expansion of this, and then we're going to skip to the end. And the rest of the steps are in your notes if you care about the algebra. So we have um, S sub C equals K N naught ln N naught minus N naught minus N1 ln N1 plus N1 minus N2 ln N2 plus N2. which we will simplify as n1 plus n2 ln n1 plus n2 quantity minus n1 ln n1 minus n2 ln n2, where we had canceled some terms here just by the definition of n1 and n2 being equal to n naught. So then we are going to uh, skip steps because they don't involve any polymer physics to get to minus k n1 ln of n1 over n naught plus I feel as though if I were left-handed, I would get higher cape evaluations. <laughs> I guess we'll never know. N2 times ln N2 over N0. OK, now we're going to make a, uh, a uh, define something here. N1 over N0 and N2 over N0 is a mole fraction because it's the number of things of one divided by the total number of things in the system, which gives you a, uh, a mole fraction. So n uh, sub i over n naught is defined as x sub i, or the mole fraction. So what we have then in terms of mole fraction is that the configurational entropy equals minus k, the Boltzmann constant, times n1 ln x1 plus n2 ln x2. OK, this is the entropy in the mixed state. This is the entropy of an ideal solution in the mixed state. But the total entropy. Delta X or delta S of uh, superscript M is the entropy in the mixed state minus the entropy in the unmixed state. Uh, but the entropy, what is the total number of statistical microstates in a homogeneous single component solution? 
number of, micro, number of distinguishable microstates is one. <laughs> Ln of one is zero, so the whole terms are zero. So in general, delta S M of an ideal solution is just equal to SC with none of the ones and the twos. And for a multi-component system, we have minus K, the Boltzmann constant, times the summation over components, over the I components of N sub I times natural log of X sub I, the mole fraction uh, of I. So if we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, Delta G M equals delta H M minus T delta S M. We already know that delta H is zero because they have equal, equal, uh, because they have equal intermolecular forces between one and one and one and two, and two and two and two and one. Uh, and since S superscript M is just the configurational entropy of the mixed state, and we can forget about, the, about one and two because they only have one, one, in, one uh, distinguishable microstate, then we can write a total expression for delta G uh, of mixing for an ideal solution as being uh, plus T K times N1 ln X1 plus and two ln x2. And what can we say about this? Is a mole fraction, mole fraction is a fraction, right? So it's always less than one. So this is then always less than zero. An ideal solution always has a delta G uh, less, uh, less than zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was for a entirely homogeneous solution with one molecular type, correct? Mm, the S1 and the S2? Yeah. Right. This is, this is the, so anytime you have the difference in a thermodynamic quantity, you're taking the after state minus the before state. And the before state are the separate components one and two. And because there's only one way to arrange distinguishably uh, the components of a single component system, the, the, the molecules in a single component system, the configurational entropy is zero because the number of microstates is one by k ln omega. k ln one is zero. Yeah. If you were to just have like more components, like if you were to have three different components this next year, would you then just have three more turn or uh, three total turns? Yeah, you would. If you had multiple components, you would just calculate the entropy using this okay. summation. Um, what I want to uh, to end with is the idea. Before we introduce enthalpy, I want you to think about uh, the entropy of dissolution of an electrolyte. Say. Uh, what did I actually use in the notes? Lithium bromide and potassium bromide. So the entropy of dissolution of a, of a salt, you go from solid crystals in a, in a beaker of water to some homogeneous solution. Entropy positive or negative? Positive, because you have way more ways to arrange a system once it's dissolved. However, when you pour salt, a lot of salt in a beaker and you feel it, does it heat up or cool down or depends? It depends. So why does it depend? And the reason is, even though we're breaking those bonds apart between the two ionic species, we're, we're forming an unequal number of water solute bonds in either case. And in the case of dissolving a, uh, 
in the case of dissolving a lithium ion, we get many more water molecules to bond to the lithium ion because the lithium ion is a small concentrated charge that needs lots of dipoles in order to lower its electrostatic potential energy, which releases more heat than, um, than dissolving a potassium ion, which only takes five as opposed to three molecules of water, or which only takes three as opposed to five molecules of water to solubilize it, and those bonds aren't as strong. So in fact, lithium bromide, when dissolved in a solution, uh, heats up, whereas potassium bromide uh, cools down. So we'll talk about why that is Get, once we introduce unequal intermolecular forces on Monday. Thanks, have a good weekend.